We're happy to start the second session of this really fascinating day. And our first speaker is Professor Bacheva Kerem from the Hebrew University of Jerusalem. We will speak about the complex nature of recurrent genomic instability in cancer. Thank you, Sheva. Thank you, Ornit, for inviting me to present our results. And actually, after a short introduction, the main talk will be presenting uh, results that are not published yet. So any comments, any thoughts, we'll, we will be very happy. <clears throat> so as was mentioned earlier already, genomic instability is one of the hallmarks of cancers, among others. And the reason that genomic instability is a hallmark, because it is a driver of tumor genesis that increases the propensity for genomic alterations and accumulation of mutations. And our basic question is, what is the molecular basis for genomic instability in early stages of cancer development? And another way to ask this question is, why do cells that are enforced to proliferate by cancer genes, why do they acquire genomic instability? What is the difference between a normal cell proliferation and a cell that is enforced to proliferate? And our first hypothesis was that replication, <clears throat> DNA replication is involved. And we all know that DNA replication is a complex process, tightly regulated to ensure faithful genome duplication. And any perturbations of DNA replication leads to DNA damage and genome instability. This is known for many, many years. And we hypothesize that perturbation of DNA replication that leads to DNA double strand breaks and genomic instability. This is the driving force <coughs> of DNA damage in early stages of cancer development. And the project, which is the introduction to, the, to my talk today, is a project that we published over 10 years ago, where in this project we analyzed the effect of oncogenes on the DNA replication DNA damage and tumorogenicity. And the oncogenes that we chose initially to study were two. One is cyclin E, and the other one are two genes, E6 and E7, which are encoded by the human papilloma virus uh, 16, and they are known to be the oncogenes of this virus. And each of these <coughs> is abrogating the entry into S phase by perturbing the RBE2F pathway. And in order to investigate the possibility that DNA replication is involved and is perturbed in early stages of cancer development, we are using a methodology with high resolution, which is called <coughs> DNA combing. In this technology, we are stretching DNA strands that were in the cells <clears throat> labeled with two nucleotide or nucleoside analogs. So as can be seen here in, um, in green and in red, these are the analogs that we can detect with antibodies. You can see the stretched DNA very uh, clearly. So here, is a slide with the DNA fibers, which is stained with an anti-DNA antibody. And on the right, we can see the replicating strand stained with the antibodies, again, the nucleoside analogs. So under, we can measure, we can use this technology to measure the dynamics of replication, which is the rate we can calculate, measure and calculate 
the rate of the progression of the replication fork, and we can get an idea about origin firing. It is known that if the replication is perturbed, then a classical replication stress will result in a slow replication fork movement and activation of more origins trying to compensate for the slow replication. So, and there are other uh, criteria that we are using. I will mention these two. So if we see slow rate and more origin, which means that the distance between adjacent origin is decreased, then this is a sign of replication stress. And as this was published already more than 10 years ago now, I will just summarize what we have found when we expressed the oncogenes, either of them. So what we found using the DNA combing when looking at the replication is that the oncogene expression, which enforced cell to proliferate, <coughs> did it in cells that had insufficient nucleotide biosynthesis. And this insufficiency led to a low nucleotide pool. And when there is a nu low nucleotide pool, there are not enough nucleotides as the building blocks of the DNA replication. Then there is a replication stress, slow forks, and additional origin firing. And this leads to the double strain breaks and in genomic instability. So this is known for more than 10 years. <clears throat> and just before, I want to show another way to look at our results with oncogene is another way to, to explain the same result is that in a normal proliferation, in a normal cell, the signal for proliferation comes from growth factors outside the cells. And if there is a growth, a, a growth a factor receptor, then there will be a binding of the growth factor. And this will elicit all the required pathways to support DNA replication and DNA proliferation. And this includes nucleotide biosynthesis programs since the nucleotides are needed for the replication and they are tightly regulated to increase the biosynthesis when DNA replication is required. And of course, many, many other pathways are regulated by this binding of the growth factor to its receptor. However, when an oncogene signal is leading to proliferation, then cells are enforced to proliferate and to replicate their DNA, but there is no regulation of other pathways. So there is not enough nucleotide biosynthesis. It's, the program is not upregulated, as well as many other pathways. And following our work, several other studies showed with other oncogenes, RAS and BCL2, and now with others, that indeed nucleotide pool depletion is an underlying mechanism for genomic instability in early stages of cancer development. And the main question that I want to discuss today was, does loss of tumor suppressors induce replication stress? and lead to genomic instability. And what are the molecular mechanisms underlying this stress? And it is highly relevant to cancer, as during cancer development, there is various factors, of course, contributing. And this includes oncogene expression that we just discussed, but also tumor suppressor loss or uh, malfunction. And the, the tumor suppressor that we are focusing on is P53. <clears throat> and this work is performed by a very talented PhD student in my lab, Wissam Zatwa. 
And P53, which I guess is known to everybody here in the room, <coughs> is regarded as the guardian of the genome. And mutations in P53 are found in the majority, more than 50% of tumors, various types. P53 has, of course, a normal, many functions under normal conditions, which are mentioned here, including cell cycle arrest, if there is a need for this, DNA repair when there is DNA damage, and if the cells cannot accommodate the damage, cannot deal with the damage, then cells, cells will be sent to apoptosis or senescence or will die in another way. So we tested our question regarding the, the contribution of application stress to instability caused by P53 in two different uh, systems. The first was by down-regulating P53 in tissue cultured cells. And we can see here that using an SH against P53, there is a very significant down-regulation of P53, as expected. Then we some used the DNA combing, the stretching of these DNA fibers, and measured the replication rate following knock knockout or knockdown of P53. So as we can see here, these are the cells that were, that are expressing an empty vector or a scrambled one. So no down regulation of P53. We can see that the rate is 1.4 KB per minute, which is a normal rate. Following P53 down regulation, as can be seen here, the replication rate decreases significantly, gets in these experiments to 1.1 KB per minute. Analyzing the distance between adjacent origins shows a significant decrease in the distance, which means that more origins were firing or were fired. So this is a clinical, this is a classical replication stress. And when we analyze the DNA damage by several markers, I'm showing here the phosphorylated histone H2AX, which is getting phosphorylated when there are DNA damage around the damage, we can see very clearly that the down regulation of P53 is leading to a significant increase in the generation of DNA double strand breaks. So the question was, does nucleotide insufficiency play a role in replication stress and genomic instability caused by P53 down regulation? So we supplemented the cells with a nucleoside, A, U, G, and C. In some experiments, we did A, T, G, and C, same results. And we can see that the down the significant decrease in the replication rate is totally rescued by the addition of exogenous nucleoside. So in these experiments, the rate was 1.4. Down regulation of P53 <clears throat> led to 1.1. And then by supplementing the cells for 48 hours with a low concentration of these nucleosides, the replication rate is now 1.3 and is not different from the scrambled. Same result we see with the fog distance. We see, as we saw earlier, that there is a decrease in the distance between um, adjacent origins, and it is very nicely rescued by the addition of exogenous nucleosides. And last but not least in this series of experiments is the effect of adding the nucleoside on the DNA damage. So we can see that in normal cells, um, scrambled cells in this case, the level of damage is very low as expected. We do see many cells with high damage, which is nicely rescued by the addition of the nucleosides. And the second system that we are studying are cells from a syndrome 
called leaf or many syndrome, and we are uh, studying primary fibroblast of these patients. So leaf or many syndrome is a hereditary cancer predisposition syndrome. And the patients are born with heterozygote germline mutation in P53. It is inherited and expressed as an autosomal dominant inheritance, an inheritance, autosomal dominant disease. And the patients suffer from a very high <coughs> cancer development risk during their lifetime as a result of the loss of the wild type P53 function. So they are born with one wild type allele, but the other one is mutated. And during life, many, many times, also already as children, they develop pediatric um, cancer due to the loss of the wild type P53 allele. It's a similar story uh, as we know from the BRCA1, BRCA2 uh, germline mutations. In culture, interestingly, the leaf for many cells grow until they reach a proliferation crisis. And some of these cells can escape the crisis and then they be, become immortalized, they can proliferate forever, and they have tumorgenic features. So we analyzed, um, we have a small um, collection, if we can say collection, uh, of fibroblasts from many syndrome cells. We can see here two of them, patient 87, patient 41, and we see that in culture, spontaneously, they lose the white type allele. So in patient 87 is a loss at the DNA level, so we are losing the allele. And I'm not sure that we can see. Okay. Can you see the? Yes, yes. Okay. And in the other patient, on the DNA level, we do see still the Y type allele, but you can see on the Western that there is a loss of the P53 uh, protein and a generation of a smaller protein, which we found is non functional. So, what do we see in these cells? We are using DNA combing, and what we can see is that close to the crisis, passages 25, 27, some like, something like this, <clears throat> we, we see a significant reduction in the replication fork uh, rate, and we see also a reduction in the fork distance. So classical replication stress close to the crisis. And here are the same results with another leaf or many patient. What about DNA damage? So we can see, we can see here patient 87. This is the level in, of the damage in a fibroblast, normal fibroblast compared to what we see in passage 26 in cells of these patients, a very, very high DNA damage, okay? And in, uh, L, in patient 41, uh, we see the same, although the baseline here is very high DNA damage already. So does nucleotide insufficiency play a role in the replication stress and genomic instability that was caused by spontaneous P53 loss in the LFS cells. So initially, we supplemented the cells, what we call now shorter, 48 hours, as we did with the oncogenes. And we can see that indeed adding to the culture exogenous nucleoside is rescuing the replication for great this, uh, defect as well as the origin firing by the fog distance. We can see a very significant rescue. And if we look at the DNA damage, here is in patient 41, we see also a rescue. And then we decided to treat the cells with exogenous nucleoside for a longer 
time. So we start before the crisis and we follow the cells. And what we can see that if we started at, to supplement the cells with exogenous nucleoside at passage 25, cells are still dividing, of course, and analyze them at passage 29, either with exogenous nucleoside or without. So we can see that the AU GNC supplementation significantly rescued the replication for great progression, significantly uh, increased the distance between adjacent origins, so less origins are firing, which is a sign of normal replication relative to the situation before that. And very interestingly, the supplementation of the AUC and G allowed the cells to proliferate more. So we can see at least two population doublings more in the cells that were treated until they reach, because they are primary fibroblasts, they reach the point that they will stop proliferating anyways, because they are primary fibroblasts. So this was really very important to see that the nucleoside supplementation rescued the replication stress, as I will show in the next slide, rescued the DNA damage and also the proliferation with a long-term uh, supplementation. And here are the DNA damage results, looking at the phosphorylated H2AX, as we saw earlier. But here we can see another marker of a replication-induced DNA damage, which is 53BP1. And the, their co-localization, uh, we can see here the effect of adding the exogenous nucleoside on all cells in the culture, and we do see a very nice rescue, but it is clear that most of the rescue comes from S phase cells. So here we are looking at cells that are uh, um, marked by EDU, and the DNA um, damage markers, and we can see here is passage 30, without the supplementation, and here is passage 30 with the supplementation. There is a huge res rescue of the uh, DNA damage. So I would like to summarize what I showed. At the beginning, I summarized that oncogenes induce replication stress by driving proliferation without insufficient nucleotides. And uh, later, I show that P53 Y-type loss, either by downregulating it or spontaneously in um, lipharmeni cells, causes replication-induced DNA damage. And that the molecular basis underlying this is insufficient nucleotides. Oh. And now we are trying to understand why loss of P53 is driving insufficient nucleotides. So we, perf we are performing metabolomic analysis, just got the result this week from the first experiment, and also proteomic analysis. And we do have interesting results. I will not speak about them. They are very, very preliminary. They may shed some light on why there is less uh, nucleotides. And we also initiated already experiments to investigate the combined effect of expressing an oncogene and at the same time losing a tumor suppressor gene. And this is a collaboration with Uri Ben David, who is here. And uh, we have a very nice system that uh, Uri's group generated. This time it's not a fibroblast, but uh, epithelial cells from breast cancer, uh, an oncogene expressed, many oncogenes. Uh, with and without P53 loss. So we'll see what we are getting. <clears throat> so here is my group. Uh, Asaf Bester did the oncogenic uh, studies, and here is with some that we already mentioned. And here are the collaborators and the funding of the project. 
Thank you. Thank you. Just counterintuitive. Yeah, I know. Yeah. This is what we found that if you lose P53, then the replication is perturbed. Okay? There is also a transient in, in fibroblasts, transient uh, proliferation crisis, but cells are not stopping, okay, if they are the BJ cells. They have some crisis. We see that they feel not that good, but they will go out of it, whereas the primary cells from patients, <laughs> they will attenuate, they will stop, and then they will, some of them will, will go out of it. Just the prerogative of the chair, so I'll... Okay. Uh, quick question. Yeah. For, did you check other genetic syndromes, like Lynch syndrome, that may be associated with the loss of... No. Yeah, not yet. Not yet. This is uh, all what we managed to do. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bacheva. This is really uh, interesting stuff. The next speaker is also from the Hebrew University, but on the other campus at Adasta Medical School, uh, Professor Yuval Dor, epigenetic liquid biopsies for cancer detection and monitoring. Thank you. Okay, great. Thanks very much for the invitation. Happy to share with you um, um, a story that we've been, de been developing over the last decade or so is a change of topic here. We're talking about diagnostics. <clears throat> and the topic is epigenetic. Liquid biopsy, uh, liquid biopsies are probably familiar to most of you. It's been a concentrated effort of many people uh, in my lab with really essential um, uh, assistance and collaboration with many, many clinicians at Adassa, Sharetzedek, Ichilov, many hospitals abroad really couldn't be um, done without these guys and lots of generous um, uh, funding sources. Most important, I want to mention my key collaborators because this is really an interdisciplinary operation, you understand why, is Wouti Shemer is, is a long-standing, long-time methylation expert, Ben Glazer is a clinician and endocrinologist at Adassa, and Tommy Kaplan is a student at Netanel Leufer, um, uh, computational biologists. All right, so what are we talking about? We're talking about uh, this concept of uh, 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 liquid biopsies that is a technology that allows us to use cell-free circulating DNA. What is that? We know for many, many decades that when cells die, some cells in some cases, they release uh, short, uh, short fragments of cell-free DNA, nucleo nucleosome size. Actually, it's not cell-free DNA, it's cell-free chromatin because the DNA is wrapped around histones. And this is released to uh, our blood. Those fragments have a very short half-life, probably between 15 and 60 minutes, and then they are cleared probably in the liver and kidney. There's much that we don't know there, but they're present in plasma in low amounts, so there are about a thousand genome equivalents, that's the term we use in the field for like uh, the amount of DNA, five, five nanograms, this is you know, broken pieces that come all together from uh, the amount of uh, a thousand cells, but of course for many, many more, per one, one, one milliliter of healthy plasma, and if you think about that, that's a tiny fraction compared with the uh, five times, 5,000 times more genomic DNA that's present in leukocytes, so we really have to separate these leukocytes to get the um, <clears throat> true cell-free DNA. And this has been used, really exploded um, in the last decade or so because of the advent of next generation sequencing. And the most advanced utility is, of course, many of you know, is non-invasive prenatal testing, NIPT, where you can sequence the plasma, the cell-free DNA in the plasma of a pregnant mother and identify fetal, fetal uh, sequences coming from the placenta and essentially genotype the embryo or at the minimum what is done now is identify um, uh, chromosomal aberrations without risk, of course, of punching uh, the embryo. 99% uh, of the people doing, are doing, uh, doing liquid biopsies are focusing on cancer, mostly now for uh, monitoring known cancers uh, and detecting them, monitoring them via mutations. And the holy grail there is, is really sensitizing the assay sufficiently to allow for a screening and, and, and early cancer detection, healthy, in other words, healthy, in people that think we're healthy. And a small but important uh, piece of, the, of that um, uh, arena is, is organ transplant rejection. So people that are transplanted with solid organs, if you find self with DNA fragments harboring SNPs of the donor, this is an indication of an upcoming serious rejection. You can treat those patients uh, earlier. But if you note, all these cases rely on something simple. You identify 
altered DNA or sequences or, or mutations in uh, the tissue that you're interested in, the fetus, the tumor, the, or the transplant compared with the host. But if you think about that, the vast majority of cell death events in our body involve cells with a normal genome, right? So they release uh, uh, the, your germline genome fragments, so how to identify um, cell death in tissues that have a genome identical to the host. And turns out that the answer to that is uh, epigenetics. And there is an extremely rich information that is present in the cell-free DNA or cell-free chromatin epigenome. We're just starting to reveal the, the information content. So one obvious uh, aspect, I would argue the most fundamental and important, I'll elaborate on that, is DNA uh, methylation. And as you'll see in a minute, can help us identify the tissue origins of those uh, cell-free DNA. Uh, fragments and also infer uh, about um, um, the, the cell turnover rate of those tissues. Another uh, a concept is related to the fact that it was discovered quite late by actually by Neil Friedman for Hebrew University, this idea that I mentioned that cell-free DNA is actually wrapped around chromatin. If you look at histone modifications in fragments of cell-free DNA, you can infer both the tissue origins of those fragments, but also the transcriptional state and this is something really crazy, yes? From cell-free DNA fragments, you can infer what genes were expressed in the cells before they died and released cell-free DNA fragments. This goes really well. And there's also this emerging field of fragmentomics where people are looking at using next-gen sequencing at fragment size and the end positions and, and the topology of those fragments. And this also contains information that allows to infer both tissue origins and uh, gene expression. And this is really wonderful because this is in, all these approaches are independent of knowledge of somatic mutations and, and um, they also they can detect uh, cell-free DNA coming from normal cells and it's universal because the epigenome is, is, is uh, conserved so this applies to all people and all, all diseases. Um, and, but we're, we have been focusing on, on DNA methylation so quick you know, crash course so of course all cell all cells in the body have the same DNA sequences, but each cell type, not tissue, not organ, but each cell type activates only a subset of the genes. And the reason for that is this epigenetic and epigenetics and the deep, deepest level of epigenetics is, is uh, DNA methylation. So DNA methylation determines which genes will be silenced and which genes can be activated in a given, in a given tissue, but we're using that now as a biomarker. Right? And, and, and we know a lot about the methylation. It's a stable, covalent uh, modification on CPG in DNA, and it's, um, it's determining cell type identity. Therefore, it's not really a marker. It is a determinant of cell, cell identity. And since it's covalent, it survives in uh, cell for DNA. And, and, and the methylation patterns are really conserved among cells of the same type and, about, and, and among individuals. They're largely conserved in aging and in pathology uh, conditions, including in cancer. Um, so the idea is really to identify the, the tissue origins of cell-free DNA using tissue-specific DNA methylation patterns in cell-free DNA. And on the right, I'm showing a few classical examples, which are also using, I think we all started in our lab because of our interest in, in diabetes with the insulin. So the insulin gene contains multiple CPGs. They would be methylated in all cell types in the body, which are not allowed to express insulin, but only in pancreatic beta cells in the pancreas. They are unmethylated, which opens up chromatin there. So in every plasma, you have about a thousand fragments of the insulin gene. Typically, they would all be methylated. Every such fragment that is unmethylated can come from only one place, from beta cell that has died in the last 15 minutes to an hour. That's the basis of the idea. And the same goes for surfactant as a marker of, of lung epithelial cells and albumin of liver. But to go beyond that, you need an atlas. You need a reference methylome atlas. And that's what we've been developing over the last um, uh, six or so years. And we've published that in, in, two, in two waves. One uh, was based on um, uh, publicly available data, which we consolidated. And one was a major effort published last year in Nature with Tommy Kaplan and many, many surgeons in Adassa, where we performed this uh, really massive operation of obtaining surgical specimens from clinicians at Adassa, dissociating the tumors, or the normal tissue actually is adjacent to the tumor, fact sorting the cell type of interest, and subjecting that to whole genome by sulfate sequencing. So as a consequence, we have um, a large matrix containing all major human cell types in the body. And for each, we have the methylation pattern of all 30 million CPG sites um, in the genome. And when you do that, it's, it's, immediate, it's trivial that every cell type is expected. And by definition, has dozens to hundreds of 
sites in the genome that are unmethylated in only, the, only in this cell type and methylated elsewhere, and a small number that are methylated in that cell type and unmethylated elsewhere, doesn't matter so much, and, and these are uh, multiple, multiple biomarkers now for that. And, and as a side, I would say that, as a side note, I would say that the study was meant for uh, diagnostics, and I'll talk about that, but we also were able to obtain many insights into the principles of cell type specific DNA methylation, for example, those loci that are hypomethylated in a given cell type and methylated elsewhere, these are enhancers. These are the enhancers that control gene expression that is tissue specific uh, uh, in that cell type. There are only few, very few hypermethylated sites in a given cell type. These are typically, we think, are sites that are important for the 3D organization of the genome in a specific cell type. Uh, an important finding was that there is an extremely small inter-individual variation. You, you saw three breast epithelial cell methylomes from three different women, you saw it all, right? We're all very similar in, 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 this, in the landscape of our uh, methylation pattern, which allows us to manage that with only a few, few samples. And, and I'll, I'll skip that other point. Um, so here's a, a blow up of that uh, part of that atlas. So, right, so the, the rows are different uh, human cell types and the uh, columns are uh, loci in the genome, and so blue is unmethylated. So what you see here, for example, are about 30 uh, thin columns. These are loci in the genome that are blue, so that are unmethylated in hepatocytes and fully methylated elsewhere. Each one of these is a marker. You see that in its unmethylated version in plasma, it's coming from a, a, a hepatocytes. So we're very proud of that atlas, which proved to be super um, uh, useful, but it's still not complete, and there are some obvious missing entries, which are too difficult to obtain in, in, in the lab setting. We've completely failed on, identi on isolating bone cell types, osteoblasts, osteoclasts. If anyone knows how to do that, please call us. It was just too difficult. We gave up. There's still a whole uh, um, set of, of monocytes and tissue-specific macrophages, which apparently are different cell types that can generate different markers, but for us right now, they're all combined. Same for fibroblasts. Turns out that nobody knows how the fibroblast methylome looks like in vivo. We all culture them in vitro, but in vivo, it's not trivial at all. Subset of hepatocytes, adipocytes, and many other omissions, but we do with that. So what do we do with that? At last, the, the key application really is to deconvolve the, the, the untargeted cell-free DNA methylome, right? So you, you extract, you obtain plasma, you extract cell-free DNA from plasma, you subject that to whole genome uh, uh, methylation sequencing, the plasma, cell free DNA, and you interpret that using the atlas to obtain a pie chart like that. So this is the normal, right? Uh, I think it's, the, it's not my own, it used to be my own, but now it's the average of many people. So about 30% of our cell free DNA normally comes from neutrophils. About 30% come from megakaryocytes, which is a surprise because they reside only in the bone marrow and they release platelets, but as they are done releasing platelets, they are releasing their own cell-free DNA. About 20% for monocytes slash macrophages. We don't know what we're talking about here. There might be macrophages from many, many places. Only few erythrocyte, few erythrocyte progenitors. You generate two million erythrocytes every second, but at the bottom of every erythrocyte, there is a macrophage that swallows the, the, the nucleus that is extruded, and all the, I mean, the, the failures in the process are those small numbers of erythrocyte progenitors. A bit of lymphocytes, that's an important point. There are plenty of lymphocytes in our, in our blood, but they're stable, they're static. Typically, if you're not sick, they're not turning over, so their representation in cell free DNA is low, right? So this is a marker not of cell abundance, this is a marker of cell turnover. And only two cell types we identified as coming from solid tissues and present normally in cell free DNA, the vascular endothelial cells, makes sense, they have nowhere to go, they fall to the blood, and hepatocytes as well. So this is the normal, and, and obviously, now you can look at that. You can do this exercise in, in, in people with, uh, with a disease, and that's, here's one, unfortunately, still unpublished, <laughs> a long time ago should have been published, uh, COVID-19. So these are, this is the self DNA composition of hospitalized people with COVID-19, and you see many, many things there. For example, you see elevated lung cell free DNA. You see zero in healthy people, because it all goes to cough, but for some reason in, in, in people with COVID, it goes to, Architecture is inverted and, and goes to circulation. We find it. Elevated level of endothelial cell, cell for DNA vascular damage, which actually predicts both these type, both these things actually predict, uh, which don't have good biomarkers right now, actually predict clinical de deterioration. That's important. And what's even more interesting, I think, to me is that when we went to those um, meloniot 
uh, uh, when we um, isolated individuals that have no clinical symptoms whatsoever, and we collected plasma from them, we saw, we saw there elevated levels of self dnm from immune cell types. Expected, this is why they're not sick, right? But also huge elevation in erythroblast, self dna in vascular endothelial, self dna and even these mild to asymptomatic cases may be hinting at what is going to happen to them later, long COVID. Two minutes, over boy. Um, there's also a targeted way of doing that, which I'm not talking about. And we published many papers uh, related to that uh, in the last uh, several years, some of them related to cancer. I'll focus on just two things now. One, I think the most the important promise is uh, with inf uh, immune-derived cell free DNA, uh, which, as, as I mentioned, very different from cell counts. So for example, B cell counts are not elevated in people with B cell lymphoma, but B cell cell free DNA is highly elevated because you really read the turnover that happens in the bone marrow. The same also goes for sterile inflammation. In this case, eosinophilic esophagitis, doesn't matter. A few words about cancer. The potential of cell DNA methylation analysis in cancer is, I think is tremendous. It's probably mostly in the context of early detection, but also in monitoring, et cetera. And, and uh, we think that the way forward is to generate panels relying on an atlas that will allow you to get really a comprehensive view of what's dying in a cancer patient, cancer-specific methylation markers, but also normal markers that tell you on the rate of turnover of epithelial cells, normal adjacent cells, vascular endothelial cells, macrophages, immune cell types, a very comprehensive picture of what's dying in a patient. Here's a quick example in one minute, several uh, lovely methylation markers of the exocrine pancreas, right, unmethylated in astral cells, in duct cells, and, uh, and fully methylated elsewhere. You can use these markers to identify Self free DNA coming from, uh, uh, coming from exocrine pancreas in people with local and metastatic as well as local pancreatic cancer. And we combine that with KRAS mutations and with uh, CA199, the, the, the classical, non, so, not so much specific uh, cancer marker. You can really get a very good rock curve, promising that multimodal, multiomic. Analysis of, uh, of cell free DNA may reach really eventually sensitivity needed and specificity for early cancer detection. Last word, surprising finding that um, specifically in localized pancreatic cancer, in, in people with pancreatic cancer that have metastases to the liver, we see elevated levels of hepatocyte cell free DNA. Makes sense, right? The liver is damaged because of the incoming uh, cancer cells and releases cell free DNA from hepatocytes. But Specifically in, in, in pancreatic ductal carcinoma, also in, in less so in people with colorectal cancer, we see elevated levels of hepatocyte cell within the local, already in the local stage. Something strange here, right? Two more localized to the pancreas, and for some reason there are elevated levels of hepatocyte cell of hepatocyte cell for DNA. This is, we have now novel markers for cholangiocytes and other cell type of the liver. They're also elevated in patients with localized. Uh, liver disease, really interesting. We don't know what it means. Perhaps uh, a evidence of premetastatic niche taking place in the liver, some uh, cytokines released from the tumor to the liver and, and reprogramming the metabolism there or collaborating with islet errors on that. We don't know uh, the significance of that, but it is helpful as another marker for detecting uh, pancreatic cancer. So in summary, I showed you that the patterns really reveal the dynamics of tissue-specific cell death methylation patterns. Elevated exocrine pancreas cell free DNA in pancreatic cancer, not in premalignant lesions, which is a good thing, right? In IPMNs and also in other cases of uh, pre cancer, we don't see that. So it's really a marker for uh, uh, cancer at early stages. I talked about the puzzling elevation of liver derived cell free DNA in people with uh, PDAC, and I think the multiomics are the way forward for really enhanced, enhanced specificity and sensitivity. And two last points, I think that. Um, uh, it's still open question whether liquid biopsies can detect cancer early enough to change the course of disease, right? It's not a big deal to detect stage four cancer before everyone else does, but it won't help, right? So you need really early on. It's still an open question. We should be really realistic about what will it, will it take to determine the answer to that question. You need a multi-million or multi-hundreds of thousands uh, individuals that don't have don't know who have cancer, and you have to sample them and see whether your uh, assay is able to uh, detect cancer early. It's really not a mission for an academic lab. Uh, and the last thing I, I mentioned just to provoke here is that I think there are many, many things that we don't know about the fate of DNA from coming from dying cells. 
two points that are really puzzling to me. First of all, it seems that uh, um, the vast majority of DNA of dying cells is actually consumed locally. And what everybody is studying in my field, cell free DNA, is actually the shadow, the 1% to 0.001% of stuff that escaped local consumption and reaches circulation. So there's something very powerful taking place inside the tissues. And the second is that DNA is self DNA is cleared very rapidly, and there's a large opportunity there to slow down transiently that release. There was a science paper about that a few weeks ago that if you block transiently the removal of self free DNA, then self free DNA levels may elevate tenfold, and your sensitivity for detecting cancer may be elevated uh, 10 times, uh, which is very promising. I'll end with that. This is the vision for you know, the future that is becoming unrealistic, right? A blood test that will tell you what are the turnover rates of your different cell types in your body compared with your norm, your own norm or, or population norm. And this can be effective for early cancer detection or taken by large companies, I think. Other pathologies such as Alzheimer's, monitoring uh, disease progression, response to treatment, drug drive to toxicity, but also applies to other, we found ourselves emerging now in many other surprising fields. For the police is super interested in that because the police cares about typically who left that DNA, but sometimes they care about, they, don't, they know who left the DNA, but the question is whether would that saliva or sperm, for example, right? So methylation markers, can you easily tell you whether this was sperm or saliva, which makes a big difference in the criminal, in the criminal context and any other applications. So I'll stop here, I took too much time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Yuval. Angel. Amazing. Um, and, uh, amazing. Uh, yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. <laughs> he said amazing. Yes. <laughs> can, you, can, you defer, can you defer between cell free DNA methylation pattern of lymphocytes and exhausted lymphocytes? Because then you can get a marker for the presence of yes. cancer yes, processes yes, yes. that change. So the, 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 so the lymphocytes and exhausted T cells. The general answer is that, I wanna give a general answer. Methylation can distinguish between cell types. It cannot distinguish between cell states. Stuff that is changing every morning, gene expression does not change methylation, right? We think that exhausted T cells are cell, a distinct cell type, and we just got our sort of exhausted T cells, which we are now sequencing, so we'll know very soon. But I fully agree that this is a key potential application of what's happening inside the tumor in terms of turnover. Yeah. Fantastic. Fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> okay, a question, maybe I'm missing something. In, regarding cancer, yeah. we know that methylation is changed. Right. Hypo, hyper. Do you accommodate for this, or are you looking at the normal methylation? Yeah, very good question. So everything that we've done so far was focused on the normal patterns of DNA methylation in specific cell types. But what people studying cancer epigenetic changes don't realize is that the epigenetic changes in methylation, for example, in cancer, is, is, a, is taking place in 10% to 30% of the methylome at most. So the vast majority of the methylome of breast cancer is breast. And we actually validated that each of our markers that is universally identifying, say, breast or pancreatic epithelial cells is retained, is not changed in, in tumors. So they remain kosher and, uh, and able to detect uh, uh, DNA from, from those cell types even when they are transformed. A completely different angle is to look for specifically for methylation changes in cancer and turn these into cancer-specific methylation markers, and people are, are doing that. It's more difficult because it's, it varies. Not all cancers change to the same degree, so you need to look at many more patterns, but it's possible. And actually, the, the currently available uh, um, commercial platform by this company called Grail, which we collaborated with a little bit, so initially they look at cell free DNA, identify methylation changes that tell them there's cancer. If not, they throw it. If, if yes, then they're asking what are the tissue origins based on those normal markers that we found. And then the, their answer is powerful because they say, oh, that patient has likely uh, cancer and it's likely in the pancreas, which makes a big difference for follow-up. We need another superlative from... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> beautiful. <laughs> so my, my, my question is actually related to Gray. 
because gray reported already 97% accuracy, right? Which uh, something that was very, very simple. Yeah. So to what extent do you think the Atlas, I mean, how do you envision it? Because it seems like it can maybe, you know, there's no, you can't really improve accuracy much more and the sensitivity or the lack of sensitivity in the trial probably doesn't come from the lack of, uh, you know, it comes from other reasons. Yeah, For, you're right that they reported that, but I, I must say, even though they're a big company with like, I think, a few billion dollars uh, investment so far, they're not big enough to perform the experiment that is really needed. They, what they did is that we took, they took 10,000 uh, plasma samples from, I think, 7,000 cancer patients and 3,000 non-cancer. And, and on that collection, they reported this shockingly uh, high uh, ability to distinguish, to distinguish. But someone else has diagnosed those patients, right? Some of them are stage four, stage three, stage two, maybe stage two, but the woman sensed that, right? So nobody yet has identified cancer in an otherwise healthy individuals, and that was the first indication. Then you go to do a mammography or, or EUS and identify cancer and cure the patient based on that. There, this is just starting. There are few, very few cases so far. So the jury is still out whether this approach will be useful clinically, really takes a large amount of effort. Um, so yes, the, the, the specificity of their assay is very high. I mean, the ability to detect the tissue origins based on, on, on stuff like that, that, actually that particular atlas. Um, uh, but there's much more to do. First of all, we're blind, as I mentioned, to many important tissues. And, and um, the way they're doing that, doing that is that they're looking first at markers of cancer and then the cell of origin. So there are many false positives. I think 50% false positive, which may, you may live with happily in the case of pancreatic cancer, for example. But in other cases, it's not acceptable. So still much to do in a very dynamic field. I couldn't say no to a student question. So last. Thank you. Thank you very much for your talk. And I wanted to ask, you mentioned before that you see cell-free DNA in local feedback. We also check for other uh, cancers that the local uh, blood drainage go to the, to the liver, such as for rectal cancer. Um. So we tip, I, I think I get where you're going. So we typically take blood from the from the venous from the from a vein, uh, sensing essentially uh, assaying sy systemic circulation. So. I'll rephrase, I'll rephrase it. When there's a tissue that undergoes turnover, normal or cancer, it goes to where it goes normally. So lung, as I said, goes to the air spaces, the cuff. Colon actually goes to stool entirely. Skin goes outside. So some cases you'll never see unless there's disruption of the basement membrane and, and tissue architecture is reversed and stuff goes to circulation. In some cases, tissue has nowhere to go. So besides those locally eating macrophages probably, it all goes to blood. So local uh, 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 colon cancer is actually observed as self-free DNA signature in plasma. Okay, I was trying to get you to the portal vein uh, drainage of the organs. So like maybe local feedback, uh, the cancer cells, I don't know, maybe secrete something that arrives to the liver and then after it is. Cancer also gets drained by the brain. Yeah, yeah. So it's hard to get clinicians to give you samples from uh, different locations of the circulation. We're trying to get that. And for example, por portal portal vein sampling may give another a different picture than than systemic circulation. It's a very good point. We're just getting there. Thank you. Thank you. So our next uh, speaker is Dr. Frat Biar Katz from Rambam Healthcare Campus, who will speak about bone marrow aplasia following CAR T cells approach and challenges. Hi, hi everyone. I'm glad to be here, and thank you so much for this opportunity. I'm going to talk about the bone marrow aplasia and cytopenia following CAR T cells approaches and challenges. So I'm gonna give a brief introduction, um, the incidence of this phenomenon, the pathophysiology, the management and research directions. So as many of you know, CAR T cells are really a big hype in the, hematolo in a hematology, in the hematology field. And six, and since 
2017, the FDA and the European have approved six CAR T cell products for the treatment of hematological malignancies. So this is rapidly advancing, and this is uh, really a uh, um, practice changing to all of us, uh, to us as a physicians and to our patients. So generally, what we do to our patients, the patients first undergo leukophoresis to obtain their T cells. These T cells are um, uh, are sent to a company. This company, I'm talking about commercial CAR T cells at this point. Um, the t these T cells are um, activated by CD28, CD3 beads, and then they are, um, and then <coughs> they place a virus which encodes for a CAR, a chimeric antigen receptor, and then they just, um, you know, um, um, expansion these cells until they get a large number of cells which we can um, inject back to the patient. So we get, we have lots of um, antigens that we target. One of the most commonly used antigen is CD19 to target B cells. However, the downside of, of, of this is the toxicity of this treatment. When we hospitalize the patient to receive the CAR T cell infusion, we get these two very um, commonly uh, side effects, which are like you can see here, a volcano. That's how the patient is. There's a cytokine release syndrome, and there is ICANS, in short for immune effector cell associated neurotoxicity. And this is, uh, uh, while it happens, it's very, um, uh, very dramatic sometimes. And, but, but we know from the, the past years how to treat this fairly good. And what, after about seven to 10 to 14 days, the patient goes home and feels well. I mean, it's like a, a, um, a peak and then it goes down and the patient is well. Um, so I'm not gonna refer to these toxicity, toxicities, but I would like to talk about, about the less uh, uh, spoken toxicity, which, which you can see here. It, it shows, it, it appears rarely later on in this, uh, in this uh, scheme, as you can see, you have the CRS and neurotoxicity here on the first days of the infusion. And later on, we can see the, the, the cytopenias and the bone marrow aplasia, which I'm gonna talk about now. So what is unique in the hematotoxicity post CAR T? First of all, we see it in all CAR T products, no matter if it's targeting CD19, CD22, BCMA, we see it in all of these targets and also in the various disease entities, B cell lymphoma, follicular lymphoma, multiple myeloma, B cell ALL, and Munson cell lymphoma. And also, this is very, very unique to what we're used to see with every other agent we've treated up to now. It's not like any chemotherapy. It's not like any checkpoint inhibitor. We see that it, that once the, the patient goes home, his CBCs are normal, hemoglobin, platelets, white blood cells, all is okay. But then it can go down and then stay very, very low weeks month and even years after the CAR-T infusion. So this is something we, we've never seen before. Um, so it's very long persistent, could be very long persistent. It's not in all the patients. Um, and it also has a like biphasic uh, uh, nature in it. I, I, I already said that it, it goes down in the, uh, when we give the infusion, the white blood cells, the platelets, they go down, but then they go up and then they go back again when the patient is already discharged and they can go up and down throughout a year after CAR T cells. And it's also very, very severe. The, the plasia is very severe and they do not respond to treatment we give them. Why is this even important? So we promise the patients that we're gonna give them treatment that will result in great overall response rate and complete response, and this is really true. However, uh, we also promise good, good life and good quality of life, and this is not good quality of life. They have uh, increased in infections, um, they bleed, they have hemorrhagic events uh, due to the low platelet counts. Uh, they receive a lot of platelets infusion, a lot of RBCs infusions, leading to iron overload and all those complications. And, and they're hospitalized for a while, they can't go home and obviously decrease in quality of life. So this is a really big problem in the field. 
um, and not much is known. I'll show you very soon. So regarding the incidents, this is a very busy slide. I just want to point out that the in the clinical trials, um, they have described about 20 to 50 percent high-grade uh, prolonged cytopenia. And when we look at the real-world data, just pointing out this study, that is a very big study uh, done on almost 500 patients, and, and we can see here that this phenomenon is, is seen outside of the clinical trials, and about 20 to 30 percent of the patient as severe grade. What do we think is the patoph pathophysiologically, or what factors can contribute to this? So first of all, we're talking about patients that already gotten several chemotherapy lines. Their bone marrow is exhausted, so, so, so the baseline bone marrow reserve is low. Then we give them CAR T cells. The CAR T cells produce cytokines and have the cytokine-related syndromes. So uh, this is probably um, related to the, the, bo the bone marrow uh, cytopenia that we can see. And uh, um, this is due to the suppressive effect of the inflammatory cytokines. And the CAR also is persistent. We see it sometimes even 10 years after the CAR-T infusion. So if the CAR is all the time in the blood, could it result in uh, low blood counts for a long time? We don't know that, but that's one of the speculation also. And also, we must also always remember that this patient is prone to other diseases such as acute myeloid leukemia and myelodysplastic syndrome that results after uh, chemotherapy and stem cell transplant. So could, it could be also that some of these patients eventually their disease is progressing. So what, what do we know? A little bit diving into the biology. So this is uh, um, from the Sheba Center, actually one of the first trials that showed anything of the biology of this phenomenon. Um, they looked at 38 BLL and non hodgkin lymphoma patients. And they looked for, and they compared patients that had um, an early recover of their blood counts before 21 days after CAR T infusion and more than 21 days. And when they looked at all of these patients, and they looked, sorry, at a marker that's called SDF1, uh, which is, is a chemokine uh, important for the B cell development and trafficking of the neutrophils and diamatopoietic stem cells, and um, they didn't see any correlations between SDF1 level in the blood and these uh, cytopenias. However, when they looked at specifically the patient that had very long, very prolonged cytopenia, 28 days and above, uh, they did see a correlation between SDF1 and, um, and, um, and this uh, uh, bone marrow uh, aplasia. So SDF1 might be part of the, the, the pathogenesis, um, but also uh, this later um, recently published paper from the uh, Japanese group um, pulled out bone marrow and looked at the niche, the bone marrow niche. Now, they specifically looked at CD271 as a marker of mesenchymal stromal cells. And, um, and you can see here that actually they looked here at the ratio of CD271 cell versus the hematopoietic stem cell, the hematopoietic cells. And they could see that pre and post CAR T, there was a reduction in, the, in this ratio. Uh, before and after CAR T cell infusions, so suggesting that there is a reduction in CD271. That means a reduction in these mesenchymal stromal cells, or at least in the ratio between them and the normal hematopoietic cells. And here you can see it very nicely in the fit in the figure um, <clears throat> with patient with prolonged cytopenia uh, uh, here on the left and patient with. Uh, uh, sorry, patients without prolonged cytopenias on the left and patients with prolonged cytopenia on the right. And you can see here uh, the reduction of these red colored CD271 cells. So this also might complete the story. The bone marrow, obviously, the bone marrow niche is obviously involved. They also looked at cytokines in the bone marrow and in the blood. And what they saw in the bone marrow was when they looked at the patients that developed prolonged cytopenia compared to the ones that did not develop, here, as you can see here, uh, the patients that, uh, sorry, the patient that had prolonged cytopenia 
before and after CAR T infusion, uh, the 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 IL six uh, dramatically and significantly uh, um, was um, was secre the secretion was higher. Uh, this was uh, um, this was shown with IL-6 and also was shown with MCP-1, which is also known as CCL-2. Um, they didn't see, surprisingly, there was no change in, in delphilon gamma or TNF alpha, which we would explain, we, we would we would expect to see. But again, this is uh, um, done at the bone marrow one month after the the big storm, so it might be not captured in these tests. And um, I just wanted to show you this, and I'm going to show it, show it very short. But my point here, this is one patient that um, they did a single cell RNA, one patient that developed this pr uh, persistent aplasia of the, of the bone marrow, and they did single cell RNA-seq of the bone marrow. And what they show here, which is uh, uh, very important to know, and I think other studies are looking at this as well, um, when they sequence the, the TCR, uh, um, the, T, the different TCRs, they could see that before the CAR T infusion, there were multiple TCRs, as you can see here, and they're all multi-clonal. However, after the CAR T cell uh, injection, when they clone the TCRs, they could see that they're oligoclonal. And they suggest that oligoclonal T cell expansion might be part of the pathophysiology. <clears throat> so, this is the data. It's it's very. You obviously see that we need a lot more into into looking and diving into this uh, um, toxicity. Um, however, what what do we do now in the clinic? We try to early identify these patients that might end up with severe aplasia of the bone marrow. So when the patient comes and is supposed to get CAR T cells, we looked at his neutral field counts, at his platelet counts, and his hemoglobin. And also we look at baseline state of inflammatory. So ferritin and CRP, these are tests that we do very routinely in the hospital. We calculate this CAR hematotox score, and then this kind of helps us how to define if the patient now will have a quick recovery and will be good and could go home and, and not be uh, uh, very sick of this, of this toxicity, or he would have an aplastic nature, like you can see in the red. Um, and, um, and this is kind of a way to try to understand how we would face this patient, although we really have nothing to do with that. I'll show you now. Um, so after just um, last year, in the end of the year, this paper came out identifying this as a big and serious problem with CAR T cells. So they gave it a name, immune effector cell associated hematotoxicity. So now I'm going to refer to it as ICAT. And then uh, we grade these patients. Uh, if they have early ICAT or late ICAT, based on their neutral field counts and ba based on the days that go by, that they're neutral panic. It's important to think about other causes, uh, and all the time we discuss this and you know um, um, and uh, uh, think about other differential diagnoses. But eventually, most of the patients are indeed ICAT and nothing else. We think about drugs. We think about vitamin deficiency, infectious disease, and and all of that. And what how what available treatments do we have? Well, not a lot. I gave you a a, a short example. Um, we give them RBCs, we give them platelets, we give them GCSF to mobilize their uh, neutral fields to the peripheral blood, but this really doesn't help. Stem cell boost, if this patient has some cells that are stored in our bank, we can give them some CD34 cells of, of the same patient, yeah, but obviously th these are not most of our patients. We cannot collect cells from all the patients just to make sure that we would have something to give. Um, the only thing is maybe for the very high risk patients, we might consider collecting their stem cells, but this is also not very easy to do. Um, so, change of direction, TPO, tomopoietin. Tomopoietin is a, a, a glycoprotein, 
um, its receptor is called MPL, and it's mostly um, is mostly seen on the or mostly um, uh, demonstrated on the uh, megakaryocytes. So it is well known that we can um, we can we have two agents, uh, one of them called the thrombopug, for example. Um, this is a TPO receptor agonist. They bind to the the MPL receptor and then lead to um, uh, demerization of the receptor and signaling signal transduction, resulting in the secretion of platelets. Okay, so this is one agent that we use. Um, in aplastic anemia, for example, or immune thrombocytopenic purpura, where we want to have more platelets in the circulation. So um, in, in Ichilov Medical Center, we saw these patients. We were very, uh, we, we didn't know what to do with these patients with a bone marrow aplasia. So we said, why not? Let's try TPO receptor agonist. Let's see what it does. Um, it, it is a very safe drug, it's important to say. So. Um, we, we gave um, uh, this agent, El Tombopag, to uh, one patient, and uh, we could see that this is his bone marrow before receiving um, this agent. You can see it's just empty of cells, a lot of fat tissue, uh, bone, but, but, but no cells. And uh, after only two weeks of treatment with El Tombopag, you can see the bone marrow is, is now has more cells and really uh, this really helped this uh, specific patient. Um, we did this for six uh, uh, patients and, and we saw the same thing. And what we saw interesting, you can see here, this is uh, uh, the WC, the platelets, the hemoglobin, and the absolute neutrophil counts. And uh, uh, we gave the tomopog around one month after CAR T cell infusion. And you can see that, well, the platelets go up. We can see this. Um, however, another thing that we saw was the white blood cells uh, uh, went up as well and the neutral field counts. Um, so that raises a question. How, that, how does uh, tomopoietin receptor agonist um, help or, or how, what, exactly, uh, what exactly is the mechanism in the setting of bone marrow aplasia after CAR T cells? The next question we wanted to do is, okay, these are six patients, but obviously if we wouldn't have given any treatment, maybe the white blood cells or the platelets would just uh, naturally uh, uh, resolve and this patient would feel better without administering um, an agent. So uh, we took from Rambam Medical Hospital five patients exactly similar to these six patients in Ichilov. Here we show that their uh, um, characteristics are, are very similar, um, and this is not significant, but we could see that uh, El Tombobag uh, might, or TPO receptor agonist, might reduce the days of prolonged cytopenia. So in order to test this stuff, um, the, the appropriate thing is to do a clinical trial, and uh, uh, this is what we started. The PI is Professor Ron Ram at Ichilov Center, and we're, we're collecting uh, these patients. It's, it's nice to have something to give them um, and not just stand by and, uh, and look at them with, uh, with nothing to do. Uh, so uh, we treat these patients with El Tombopag. We do a bone marrow biopsy and aspiration prior to and after the administration of this agent. And uh, we look at correlative uh, analysis. Um, I'll give you an example. One of the things uh, we, we were doing is we're taking the bone marrow aplasia prior to El Tomopag administration and then ex vivo uh, uh, incubating them in the presence of TPO receptor agonists and, uh, and looking at the different hematopoietic stem cells that we might see uh, uh, that could be, uh, that, that rise, that the rise after the, this incubation. So, uh, for example, this is, yeah, okay, I'm getting there. Uh, so, for example, this, uh, uh, this uh, patient, we can see here that after um, his cells are incubated in the presence of El Tombopag, we can see a rise in the cell numbers. And when looking at the different hematopoietic stem cells, we can see that the, the El Tombopag did in, induce a rise in his hematopoietic stem cells, and, and this could be uh, the reason for the enhanced neutrophils and, uh, well, platelets, it's kind of more of the obvious, but the neutrophils that we see in our patients. 
And, and, and another thing is looking at the single cell RNA, RNA seq prior to and after administration of Eltomopag. Uh, you can see here uh, uh, preliminary results from one patient where we could see a rise in reticulocyte count and um, also a rise in uh, the monocytes and uh, reduction in the CD4 T cells, CDA T cells, and proliferating T cells, which makes a lot of sense. But this, uh, of course, needs to be um, analyzed in more patients, and this is uh, what we plan to do. So um, while the pathophysiologic is not yet clear, there is evidence of interaction between the host hematopoiesis and the CAR-T function and efficacy. We need more studies and, and more uh, um, analysis in order to determine the, what is the reason for this ICAT. Uh, treatment is developing, but novel therapeutics are still needed, and the optimal time for GCSF or TPO mimetics should be identified. And I want to thank everyone for this. Uh, this is a collaboration between uh, uh, the people at Ichilov and the people at Rambam, um, and thank you. Thank you. One question. The thinking, what is the pathophysiology? And uh, the thinking, what is the pathophysiology? You said that it occurs with every car -t. But all the car that exist today are against B cells. Also, rituximab, which is also against B cells, uh, uh, can create the same phenomena. So I just wonder whether uh, either the B cells are needed for the mild lineage, or conversely, the depletion of B cell create a pressure towards building phopoiesis on the expense of, uh, of uh, the uh, myeloid lineage. Do I need to repeat that question? <laughs> okay. So that's a very, very good point. So I would say that with rituximab, what we see is a lot is is similar, but. Um, um, less severe, and, uh, and we don't see this uh, pla uh, uh, platelet counts uh, decrease. Or, but but it's very it's uh, similar in, in what you said, and um, and also with the lymphoma patients, for example, the, their B cells uh, um, recover. They don't remain B cell aplasia compared to the ALL patients treated with CAR T. So um, and even though their B cell recover, they still have this phenomenon. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. It's a good point, though. Thank you, Ufad. Thank you. Thank you so much. So our next speaker is uh, Professor Erez Lebanon from Bar Ilan University, who will speak about RNA editing in cancer. Erez. Okay, thank you, Ronit, for the invitation. I'm happy to be here and present our work. So people take into a, a, a granted is a integration, the integrity of the flow of genetic information. People, we assume it's obvious that the sequence that we see in the DNA, we are going to see the same exact sequence at the RNA after its transcription, and then in the protein after it's translated. However, there are proteins that don't obey this very simple and basic rule, and I speak about the other proteins and the upper back proteins. Other are proteins that deaminate specific adenosine in the RNA, and the, they aminate them into I. And inosine, I, is where the CG by the splicing machinery, by the, by the ribosome. So actually we have a, a mechanism in our cell, actually in every cell in our body, that can alter the content of the genetic information. Similarly, the upper back can mediate it and change C into you, but today I'm going to speak only about uh, A to I. And the enzyme, ADAR, that is responsible for this uh, interesting phenomena, all of them, uh, we have three in, uh, in, in human, all of them dominate the target by the dominance domain and target to the substrate by double strand RNA binding domain. So they need double strand structure in order to form this reaction, to change the content of the information. And usually it's taking place before splicing, all, already in the nucleus. So if you have a region in the genome, in the primary RNA, that can form, confold on itself and form this structure, this can be a target for uh, RNA editing. And the uh, uh, other is important. We, we know that it's actually in the brain little. We cannot live without editing. And it was also shown that other uh, 
a mutation in Adar can be involved with a syndrome arcade UTA, which is involved with overactivation of the interferon. So editing can generate transcriptomic diversity. We can say we can have several transcripts. Let's say if you have four sites in the in the, in the gene, we have 16 different isoforms of this gene, and they can be uh, expressed in the same time in the same cell, in different cell, in different tissue. Um, or all together in the same uh, cell. So it's increased the transcriptomic diversity. And our labs, which is our mainly computational, we developed in the last few years several computational tools to find where editing takes place. Theoretically, it's a, it's a very simple task. You only have to compare the DNA to the RNA and look for mismatches. However, there are many other reasons, sources for mismatches. It can be mutation, polymorphism, uh, somatic mutation also, not only germline. A sequencing error, misalignment issue. So it's not that trivial task, but uh, it can be done. And together with Eli Eisenberg here in the Tel Aviv University, which recently released an atlas of all the editing sites in the human genome that change coding sequence. We have 1,500 such sites, basically in every tissue in our body, and uh, in many type of uh, genes. We have a, a, a position that the content of the emerged protein is slightly different from the original coding uh, in, in encoding in the genome. And one of the sites, AZIN, was found to be by a Singapore group to be oncogenic one, which is new type of oncogenic activity uh, of sources. The, only the editor version promote, promote uh, uh, malignancy, in, in this case, in hepatocellular carcinoma. And when we apply and look for our sites uh, across all the TCGA with thousands of different RNA sec from thousand uh, uh, patients, we see several dozen sites that, mean, that behave very similarly. It seems that the cancer promote one version, the editor or not edited compared to the non-cancer uh, um, variant. So we believe that there are several dozen more such uh, oncogen, uh, oncogenic uh, sites. But majority of editing do not take place at coding site. Almost all editing, place, editing sites take place in non-coding region, in, specifically in human, in the ALU repeats. ALU repeats are primate-specific sequences, and we have million copies of this ALU in our genome. They are each 300 base per long, which means they are comprised of 10% of our genome. And they tend to loco localize within gene, mainly in intro and UTR, so it's very uh, easy to see uh, cases when you have two inverted ALU in the same uh, genes that can form this double cell structure and this, they are edited. And this is not unique to human. When we look in many, many uh, <coughs> other genomes across all evolution, starting with coral, we see that editing actually is very common across all metazoa. With some organism with such the octopus, which fascinating stories, and human is not an uh, outlier at all. And when you look at the genome, you can understand why specific genomes have more editing and why others have less editing. It's simply the probability to form double strand structure. If you have a mobile element that are more divergent, which means they're introduced in the genome all a long time ago in evolutionary term, your editing level is going to be lower. If you have polymorph a polyndromic element, you're going to be a higher editing. So it seems that every cell in all metazoa have extensive editing. It's a huge amount of activity. Why? Why it's there? And this question was uh, addressed in the last decades with several, by several uh, uh, groups. So we know that one of the, or even the big threat for uh, any cells is a poss possibility to be infected by virus. So in this, in order to react to virus infected, the, the cell need to have a a very, a very rapid and a, a strong reaction to stop this very dangerous uh, activity of the virus. So we have in all, the, in all our cells sensor that try to estimate and see if the cell is now under viral attack. One of these sensors is MDA5, and MDA5 is sense and recognize long double strand RNA. Once it recognize long double strand RNA in the cytoplasm, it forms a filament and activates the mouse uh, pathway and eventually the interferon pathway and leading for very rapid <coughs> antiviral response. But as we mentioned, there are a lot of endogenous double strand RNA structure derived from mobile element. So the main activity of ADAR is to edit this endogenous double strand structure already in the nucleus in order to avoid 
false activation of the innate immune system uh, and recognition by the NDA5. And this was beautifully demonstrated while other knockout is lethal, other knockout combined with NDA5 knockout can ep live happily. So other activities link directly to immune uh, uh, activity. And together with uh, Shoshi Greenberg, we saw that indeed in some uh, from Shiba, we saw that in some uh, autoimmune disease, such as uh, autoimmune otitis and uh, psoriasis, we see reducing editing, we have more uh, double strand structures that contribute to the vicious cycle of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the immune response. And more recently, together with in living by, in Yuval Lab, they show that when you take beta cell, mice with beta cell and remove other from this mice in, in, in the beta cell, you get a, a very, a, a phenotype is very close to type 1 diabetes, suggesting and showing that how important other is for several autoimmune diseases. And this is similarly, when we look in cancer, we find that typically in, and we look for thousands of uh, samples of cancer sample, anything is elevated in cancer. And this makes sense because cancer can benefit from the reduced activity of the immune system. You, if you have high editing, you have reduced activity of the immune system. And indeed, we see also that the prognosis is poor when the editing is uh, high. And this led us for, a, a, we did a project with a two group with in Boston to show that indeed, when you eliminate or reduce other activity, you have better checkpoint uh, in, in so it's checkpoint, uh, immune response is, is better. So you reduce, you eliminate other uh, immune therapy work much better. And now this is a, because of this result, there are several biotech companies that have now drugs against other as an, another uh, uh, check, immune uh, um, uh, checkpoint uh, uh, drug. And now for completely different story, also regarding for editing, but for completely different angle. Cancer is a disease of mutation. Mutation are, this, are the source, are the reason why we got, uh, people got uh, cancer. And one can believe that you can utilize the other enzyme. The other enzyme can change the content of the RNA. So, and it did do it for millions of sites in the, in the cell. So if you can recruit it and convince him to do editing where you want in, in positions that you have a mutation, you can restore the mutation for the original cases where is G2A mutation. And we now live in an era that this idea is not, not considered crazy anymore because we know CRISPR. There is an enzyme that can change the content of, uh, of the DNA, but there are in CRISPR and all the other related based, technology, based editors and related technology, you have to introduce an enzyme from Cas protein, from a, a bacteria which is, a, have, a, will provoke the immune system. And it's very difficult to introduce it into the cell. But in other, other is localized already in every cell in our body. So if you have what you already need, you have to convince them to go for the position that you want to go. So you have to produce the structure that the other need for the mutation that you want to uh, edit. And therefore, you have to uh, understand exactly what are the code, what is the structural code that other prefer to edit designed for this specific uh, a mutation, guide RNA. And this is the only, the only moiety that you need to introduce. You have to only have to introduce this specific uh, uh, oligo. And together with uh, Shragi Schwarz from Weizmann, we recently uh, understand better and better what are the code of uh, the other uh, structure and to, that will allow us to design a better guide. But mainly together with Shai Ben Aruya and Bar Ilan, we generate a, a screen that allow us to check for each mutation several hundred millions different permutation in the yeast that, and find the best sequence that would recruit the other for specific mutation. This is a mutation in, a, in a eye disease that we uh, were able to um, restore via uh, this uh, platform with Dror Sharon at Duke University. And the level of editing is not very high in this case, but this is an issue of, uh, the, of our screening that we, it's, it's, uh, we can now reach only for 10% within the system, but, we, and, but when we introduce it into human cells, 
we can uh, play more with this structure and actually get for 50 and even in some cases even for 90 and even 100% of rating. So we now, when we have a mutation, we have the ability to design specific oligo that will recruit the other and will change and edit at the RNA the content of uh, and, and, uh, and fix the mutation. And uh, this is relevant not only for genetic disease, but also for cancer. And uh, if you think about cancer, again, it's disease of mutation, you can either look about people that have uh, syndromes, genetic syndromes that can increase the probability to uh, uh, be infected, to get cancer. And if this mutation that is relevant is G2A, or actually some, uh, some additional one, you can fix it. And together with and Rubin, we found that uh, about 20% of the people that have germline mutation that contributed to, uh, uh, for cancer can be fixed by uh, uh, other. And even looking at well, somatic mutation, and uh, cancer have tons of mutation typically, but only a handful of the mutation are, are driver mutation. And we find that about 60% of, uh, of the cancer have mutations, driver mutation, that can be edited by other. And uh, in even 5% of them, all the driver mutation can be uh, treated by another. So here, obviously, you, you don't, the main problem is how to bring the oligo to the cancer, uh, to the cancer tissue. There are some tissues that this, um, uh, the, this delivery issue is already solving the way for hepatocellular carcinoma, for example. But this is an ongoing project, and that we are very, very excited about it. So just to summarize, there are millions of RNA editing sites in ALU, few in coding. Editing in repetitive element is abundant in all metazoa. Elatration in editing can contribute for autoimmunity and cancer. And other inhibitors are a possible new class of anti-cancer drugs by enhancing the checkpoint inhibitor of the drugs. And other itself is a new promising tool for endogenous-based editing of of cancer mutation. You don't need to introduce all the machinery of base editor, simply introducing only the oligo or, uh, or, or the sequence that will form this specific structure. So I want to thank for all the collaboration, uh, collaborators, and uh, mainly the lab uh, group. Thank you very much. to engineer the add-on to uh, be specific for different uh, nucleotides, then you won't be uh, so, just limited to the H1? So, the amination is a feature that is easy, relatively easy to do. So, also ApoBec can do C to U. Something is more than denomination, it's much more complicated. There are a few, just a few months ago, a few weeks ago, so someone shows that he developed a base A for C to G, but it's much more complicated, and here, again, we you lose all the advantage of having the machinery in, in there. So advantage of others that you have already the machine in every cell in large quantity. So this is the, the main advantage. Thank you, Greta. So unlike DNA-based editing, here you have to provide the oligotype exactly. and then again. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Uh, so this is it. differently and what would the off-target effects be? Okay, so this is a great issue. This is disadvantage and advantage. So comparing to uh, base editors that you have to introduce as the machinery, you change the DNA, and once you change the DNA, you theoretically don't have to bring it again and again. But if you think about cancer, you have additional mutation, and this is something that, and uh, you can, it will be very difficult to introduce another time base editor. But, and also if you have a off-target off effect, it's something that you can, you have, you're stuck with this enzyme. With RNA editing, you don't have this issue because you have obviously have to deliver it again and again, but you don't care about I mean, because you don't introduce the protein at, at all. And regarding the off-target of the uh, activity, this is probably the main, one of the main advantages. Our genome used to be edited. So actually, uh, our genome as the genome of all metazoa don't under, will not go an, uh, off-target of editing because of the, you introduce one additional oligo. There are already millions of sites that are, we don't really care of them, where exactly it takes, uh, take place. So by introducing one oligo and 
testing many, many times just to be sure, you don't change overall editing at all. And it's make complete sense. You already, we have millions of slides. So this is one of the big advantages of this. Thank you. Our last speaker for the day is uh, Professor Rina Arbesfeld Rosin from Tel Aviv University, who will speak about can we use antibiotics to treat cancer? So, thank you very much, Ronit and Judith. And in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I will try to show you why and how we are trying to use antibiotics to treat cancer. So, the work in my lab focuses on studying uh, colorectal cancer and mainly the first or initial events that, le that lead to the development of cancer. And as you heard from Ronit this morning, this is one of the emerging cancer types, especially in the younger patients. Now, most uh, cases are sporadic. However, about 5 to 10% are inherit initiated by inherited mutations. Similar to other cancer types, colorectal cancer de developed in a, the adenoma carcinoma sequence. And here, just a cartoon of it or illustration starting from the normal epithelium into the metastatic cancer. And of course, throughout this path, there are many, many mutations, such as P53 that Bacheva talked about. However, one, uh, what the, the gene I want to talk about is the uh, APC. APC, adenomatous polyposis, is a gene that is mutated very early in the adenoma carcinoma sequence. Actually, APC is thought to be a gatekeeper to the, for the development of cancer. And many times when there's no mutation in APC, we do not get, we do not reach the development or the metastatic colorectal cancer. Now, the main known function of APC is as a negative regulator of the wind signaling pathway. So just uh, one slide about the wind pathway. The wind pathway is a conserved signaling pathway. It's very important in normal development. And in adults, it's mainly shut down. And it's shut down due to, due to the expression of a large cytoplasmatic complex that contains many proteins between the axin and APC, the gene I'm talking about. And the whole function of this complex is to, the, to phosphorylate beta-catenin, marking it for degradation by the proteasome. However, when the, when the signaling pathway is turned on, for example, by mutations of APC in cancer or by binding of the ligand to its receptors, this whole complex is assembled. beta catenin is no longer phosphorylated. It enters the nucleus, and we see expression of wind target genes. Now, many of these target genes control proliferation. So when we have high levels of wind signaling and high levels of beta catenin in the nucleus, we will have many times high levels of uh, proliferation, which can initiate the uh, cancer, and mainly the colon. And why mainly in the colon? This is because the important role the wind pathway has in the colon. We see here in the bottom of the crypt, in the stem cell niche, niche, the wind pathway is very, very highly active. It's very, very important for the correct proliferation of these cells. Now, following proliferation, these cells start to move upwards on the crypt, where they differentiate and turn into mature uh, colonic epithelial cells. This is in the normal epithelium. However, if we have very high levels of wind signaling, also in the cells that need uh, to differentiate, we see high levels of proliferations. So instead of, differ of, of differentiation, we see high levels of proliferation, and this in many times is the beginning of the, of the polyp, which will later on develop into cancer. However, in addition to colorectal cancer, the wind pathway and these components are also mutated in other cancer types. Here's an example of APC that I'm talking about. We see it mutated largely in colorectal cancer, but also in the other cancer types. Now, as I said, some of the uh, colorectal cancer uh, arises from somatic or uh, inherited uh, syndromes. One of them is FAP, familiar adenomatous polyposis. This is a dominantly inherited colorectal cancer syndrome in which hundreds to thousands of adenomas develop mainly in the colon, colon of the individual. If not removed, several of these adenomas will always develop into malignant cancer. And the only real treatment is a resection or entire move, removal of the colon or part of the colon. Now, FAP is uh, caused by APC germline mutations. So in each adenoma of the affected individual, we will have lost the uh, one allele due to a germline mutation, and the other 
due to a somatic mutation. So in even the smallest lesion, we see complete loss of APC function. And there's really no real treatment except for the operation. So looking closer into the spectrum of APC mutations in both hereditary and sporadic cancer, we see that these the mutations are not uh, random and they are hotspots, specific points with these mutations. And looking even closer, we see that around 30%, and now some papers are even talking about 60% of mutations being nonsense mutation, meaning a substitution of one nucleotide leading to a stop codon in the middle of the reading frame. And one question we are asking in the lab is how can we overcome these mutations? Now, this idea has been around for a long time, for many over 30 years. Here's an illustration of a translation of a wild type normal protein with a ribosome bound to the mRNA. We see a translation of a wild type protein. When the uh, ribosome reaches the normal uh, stop codon, the, we have release of a, a full length functional protein. However, if we have a stop codon in the middle of the reading frame, the complex will, will, will disassemble and we find release of a truncated, usually unfunctional protein. But for many years, it has been known that specific compounds, mainly antibiotics and mainly amino glycoside antibiotics, can bind the ribosome. They lead to some conformation change of the subunits of the ribosome, the changes in the affinity to, to the mRNA, and we see some leakiness. So the ribosome passes through the stop codon, and uh, again, we get release of some expression of full length protein, although of course not in like in the, if we had no mutations. But this seems to be a great idea and a very cool idea, and it's been around for many years. So you see, for over 30 years, scientists, many scientists and many labs have been working and trying to identify new and improved compounds that can induce non nonsense mutation read through. But very, very few you see in the green are actually reaching the clinic. And only one has been, a tolerant has been, is currently being used for a very, very small subset of uh, DMD patients. And why is that? This is mainly because most of these compounds are based on amino glycoside antibiotics that are very toxic and cannot be, be used for a long term. So although, although this idea is very cool, it's not really been used in the clinic until now. So one of the things we have done many years ago is try to look for additional read-through inducing agents. Here's an example of a, a reporter essay we used. We have GFP and BFP coding reading inserted, uh, bet and between them we insert wild type or stop codons or stop uh, codon sequences. If you will have a wild type sequence, we will have expression of a fusion protein. A mutation will have expression only of GFP. And if we can induce some read-through, we will have now expression of both GFP and BFP as a fusion protein. And this can be easily measured by Western blot, by immunofluorescence, fluorescence, and by fax, and of course by combination of these methods. So we've done many uh, such uh, screens, and one of the uh, compounds we find, found that can induce a uh, read-through is uh, another type of antibiotics called the macroid antibiotics. They are less toxic, but they of course work also less well than the aminoglycosides in inducing read-through. But they do affect some of the pathogenic APC uh, nonsense mutations. After a few experiments in, in tissue culture, we, used, we moved into mice. Luckily, there is available in a mice line called the APC min mice. APC min mice have a nonsense mutation in codon 850 of the APC protein. They develop a multiple intestine adenomas. And these mice were treated for a, with erythromycin, which is one of the macrolides I mentioned, for five days a week for 16 weeks. And the results showed a really nice reduction in the number of uh, adenomas and an increase in the uh, life <coughs> span of the mice. <coughs> so erythromycin is used in the clinic, so we are allowed to go into a, a repurposing trial. And here I collaborated, I, co I still, of course, collaborate with a very close friend and colleague, Professor Vital Karib from the Soraski Medical Center. She treats these FAB patients. So we identified FAP with nonsense mutations. These patients were treated with erythromycin for uh, four months, twice a day. The polyps were very, very carefully mapped and measured throughout the colonoscopies <coughs> by Revital. She did the colonoscopies at time zero after four months and after a year, and some are still going until now. And then she, takes, she gives me the samples, and I take them back to the lab. 
So for now we have results already for a couple of years of 10 patients where we measured the number and size of the polyps. And we, saw, we found that seven out of the 10 first patients we treated showed a very nice uh, uh, and maintained decrease in polyp burden. Because their, their treatment seemed to help them, some of them are now have, uh, receiving compassionate treatment, and we are all the time recruiting additional patients and changing our protocol a little bit. But as I said, uh, Revital, after the colonoscopies, sent me or give me the, some samples, and we try to look in the, in the lab, trying to understand what our treatment is doing. So one thing we look is the levels of beta-catenin. As I said, beta-catenin is the target of APC. So high levels of APC will lead to reduced levels of uh, beta-catenin. And here is an example of two patients we looked at, patient number two and patient number three. So as you see in patient number three, we saw a nice reduction in the level of beta-catenin, nothing in patient number two. Other things we looked at is, for example, a staining of proliferation by KS67. Again, patient number three showed a nice uh, reduction, not really much effect in patient number two. We can also grow, grow organoids from the samples Revital gives us. We take them in, in ice, we grow them into three-dimensional structures in the lab. We can, look at, we can monitor the development, the growth, and different parameters. We can try and, and see how we can restore APC in these uh, organoids. And here again, we found that patient number three uh, reacted much better than patient number two. Here we are measuring, measuring uh, wind target genes. So if you will have high levels of beta catenin we would expect to reduce levels of wind target genes. And we saw it very nicely. So we can, <coughs> by samples, can anticipate how the patient will react because these uh, results were seen very clearly in the clinic. Patient number three uh, reacted much better. So we see here we have uh, different patients are getting, receiving the same treatment and showing, of course, completely different uh, results, even on the levels of the wind signaling pathway. So we will try to work on it further. And of course, we know that many, many factors affect non transmutation reads through, sub, such as the st stop codon type. There are three different types of stop codon, the location of the stop codon, the surrounding sequence, and other parameters. And one thing we found is if we take uh, cells and start them or reduce the serum levels, we see increased levels of read through. Again, here we are using our reporter assay. We see that when the serum levels are decreased, we see higher levels of read through. We went back to the colorectal cancer cell lines, and here is an example of four cell lines that express no endogenous APC due to the non transmutation. We add, we add antibiotics now. The, re-express or we, stop, we get restoration of APC expression. And the preving or reducing serum level even increases the levels of APC. But this did not happen with all the colorectal cancer cells we tested. Here is an additional four other different colorectal cell lines that have nonsense APC mutations. Adding antibiotics increases the levels of uh, uh, APC, but serum starvation does, has no effect. So we next try to see and understand what is the difference between the two types of colorectal cancer cell lines. And we found that one big difference is the expression levels of a protein called 4-EBP1. 4-EBP1 <laughs> is a very, very strong uh, translation initiation inhibitor. So it inhibits protein translation initiation. So here is an uh, illustration of two steps in the pro protein translation uh, a process with the initiation and elongation phases uh, emphasized. They contain many proteins and, of course, many inhibitors or many compounds that can affect this process. We, so we tried some of them. Here is an example. We are using 4-EGA1, which is a strong inhibitor of initiation. Again, we're using our colorectal cell lines. If we add antibiotics, we can restore the expression of APC. However, when we add the inhibitor, the inhibitor of initiation, we see much higher levels now of uh, APC restoration. We found that when we used other uh, effectors or other inhibitors of uh, protein initiation, I'm just showing a couple of them here. Uh, so then we next wanted to look at protein, elonga protein elongation. We started with initiation, now we're going into elongation. We tried to inhibit elongation, we saw no effect. However, when we increase the elongation, again, we saw that the uh, uh, compounds can strongly increase the ability of the antibiotics to induce read-through. 
Okay, so these translation modifications do not affect read through itself, but affect the ability of the antibiotic to induce read through. The last uh, phase is protein uh, termination. Again, there are many compounds that we can use. We chose here, I'm showing one of them, SRI, using SRI to inhibit uh, protein translation termination also increases the ability of the antibiotic to induce read through. To summarize this, we have shown that targeting or inhibiting protein initiation will increase antibiotic mediated read through. You see it here in, in the bottom in the Western blot. You see increased levels of APC and reduced levels of the endogenous beta catenin target. If we increase elongation again, we see the same result. And also, inhibiting termination will increase the levels of antibiotic mediated read through. And this is a very important point because the compounds we are using to affect the translation uh, process are actually FDA approved uh, uh, drugs that are used in the clinics for other purposes, such as rapamycin. So we take them and combine them with our uh, nonsense suppressions, and we see a very, very strong effect on read through levels. So just uh, zooming out for one second, how can we induce a uh, nonsense suppression? So looking to what's happened. In, throughout all the uh, known drugs that do this, we see that actually only our uh, um, macrolides have reached the clinics that can be pe pe patients actually being treated with them. And what we are trying to do now and increases, and now we are starting to, to work with our motor with it, is to, it to increase the uh, activity of these antibiotics. And they're less toxic, they can induce read through, but we want to increase their activity. So I would just like to summarize. We, we showed you, I hope I showed you, that APC nonsense uh, mutation read through decreases adenoma burden in FAP patients. This is a potential, uh, maybe a potential treatment for both sporadic and hereditary cancer. And we are now trying to connect it with modulating the protein translation system that can strongly enhance antibiotic mediated nonsense uh, read through. This can be, of course, also used in other uh, diseases. <coughs> I would like to thank the people in my lab who have actually done the job, mainly Amnon and Michal, and Revital from the Soraski Medical Center. And I have to say she has a very difficult job because she treats these uh, patients and she tells them, look, I'm not taking out now in this colonoscopy the entire adenoma, I'm just sampling it when we will look at it next time. So it's very difficult to convince, but she has a very good relationship with these patients for many years and is very well succeeding to do that. And I would, uh, like just to thank Ronit for this wonderful day. Thank you. Thank you, Rina. We have a question here. Very nice. We tested this uh, the mycin in the context of other diseases that have uh, stop codons that might be more than work for treatment, such as Dr. Shen. Uh, wait, wait, wait. See it? See it. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, uh, we tested it in SMA. In, we have to find the cells where we have endogenous, we can see endogenous expression, not only, of course we tested it in reporter assay, we can see. Okay, but the idea was to test it in the cells that have endogenous proteins. So we tested in SMA, we tested it some, some in CF, but we have a very uh, few models. There are mice models for CF we can test, uh, and, uh, and rat disorder. In those, we did test and we do see very good effects. Very mm -hmm. Do you know which amino acid is inserted? Yeah. There is ritual because in CF, in certain uh, mutations, we know that the white amino acid is not inserted, and actually there is a generation of a recent mutation in a non-functional protein. Do you know anything it, about that? Yes, so, so that's a very good question because in general, any amino acid could be inserted, but we know we, we haven't tested for the APC yet. But we know that it, we know it's functional because it reduces the levels of endogenous beta catenin, so it has a function. We also have it in reporters, and we know that it, oh, other people have shown that the inserted amino acid is not random. So, like in CF, there are specific amino acids that will be inserted in the in the in the stop in the uh, where the stop codon was. So it's not completely random. For APC, we do not know, but we know it's still functional. But it's still, you know, just luck. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Rina. So thank you, Rina. And uh, how can I summarize this 
How was it? A wonderful, fantastic, beautiful science that uh, our speakers shows us today. So thank you to all the speakers. Special thanks to Judith Ben-Porat uh, for helping in the organization of this exciting day. Thank you to Teva Pharmaceuticals and Merck for supporting this day and our students. And uh, I think that the last four years that we've been doing this uh, um, day, World Cancer Day, and thanks to Jack and his team uh, uh, show, broadcasting it live, uh, I think we've passed through challenging times, starting with COVID and in the last year, especially in Israel, uh, before and after October 7th. And I think what we, show, what we saw today and what was shown today shows that Israeli science delivers no matter what. So thank you, everyone, and I hope to see you next year.